Okay. Um, I want to thank some people first before we get into this. I want to thank Pastor Campbell. Uh, the first, when we came here, he brought me and my wife into this office and he said, I'm for you guys. And I want you to know if you're a visitor or you're doing this place tonight, that's the kind of headship we have here. They're for us. And so that, that spoke volumes, so thank you. Um, and Miss Connie, she made blankets for my kids. Look at how many people are here. And she made blankets for my twins. So I mean, that right there shows the kind of acceptance that's in this congregation. So thank you, Miss Connie. Um, Pastor Tozer, I know he's not here, but he told me he was watching the live stream. Pastor Tozer's been a good um, example to me and a good friend and spoken a lot of valuable truths into my life. So thank you, Pastor Tozer, for all that you've done. Pastor Hill, um, I would say that there's no one with more confidence and more swag in, in this whole place. <laughs> he, uh, he challenged me, you know, go out there, get a man. So I thank you, Pastor Hill. Uh, for displaying that, but it's not machismo. Uh, I see him every morning in prayer in the Word of God. So thank you, Pastor Hill. Uh, I want to thank Pastor Tori. I know he's not here. Maybe he's not going to watch this, but uh, he he helped me and my wife when we came here. Uh, him and Stacia. So thank you so much. Then my brethren, all of you. Um, I was going to prepare a slide that said, "Insert your name here." Thank you, but I didn't get time to do that. But every one of you has been so uh, instrumental in my life, laboring alongside you, just befriending us um, when we came here, taking us to eat or having us over. Thank you so much. And then my wife, my beautiful wife, Cicely, for everything. Stand by me. She's my friend. Yeah. Okay. Now let's get down to business. Um, so the, the title of my sermon is The Perfect Balance. And I want to put a disclaimer out here tonight. This is not a balance that condones missing church for laundry that you don't have done, or dishes, or your trip to the lake, or the game's on, or you're just tired. And in fact, on the contrary, I encourage you to run as hard as you possibly can, to do all that you can for Jesus. The time is short. Press in. That's the balance I'm talking about is that, that type of balance tonight. Uh, I encourage you to have convictions, you know, to be here every time you can. Some of you may work jobs where you are working um, during service, but if you can be in this place, uh, be here, because God does amazing things He does here that He's not going to do on your couch. Um, now, the balance I'm talking about, uh, it was inspired by going around and talking to different pastors when we got uh, launched and announced. Um, I said, you know, hey, you have any advice and pastors, evangelists, and different people. And they all said two things. Uh, and some of them said both, some of them said one or the other, but they all said two things. One was God's going to build a church and God's going to help you. And the other one is just love people and take care of people. And so the balance that I want to preach on tonight is a balance between having a relationship with God and a relationship with people. Because those are the two most crucial relationships you're going to have in life. Uh, I'm going to read my text, uh, John 21, verse 12 through 17. Jesus said, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Let's pray. God, we ask you to speak to your people tonight. I pray the blessing of God upon the Chandler Church. Bless their labors. Bless their sacrifice. Bless their giving. Bless, God, all that they put their hands to. And 
May you multiply and bring supernatural increase in this place. We thank you for all that you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. So balance tonight. Balance is defined as an even distribution of weight, enabling someone or something to remain upright and steady. Uh, this balance of relationship with God and with brethren, brethren or converts or people you're trying uh, to reach um, the lost keeps us as Christians upright to not fall into sin. And it also keeps us steady in our Christian walk so that our lives are a testimony of consistency and faithfulness. It's one thing to invite someone to church one time and then you go off and get crazy. But it's another thing to year after year uh, be faithful to God's house and be faithful to invite people out. Because what happens is at some point in their life, stuff is going to hit the fan. And when it does, and when things crumble, and when things fall apart, all of a sudden they're going to know who to turn to because you have that balance, that relationship with God, a relationship with people where they know this guy's steady, this guy has consistency or stability, or this girl. Uh, I just want to share a testimony. When I was uh, in the Navy, and um, people would go through things at sea, hard times, and they would open up to me about their family, their marriage. I'm not married at this point. I'm, I have no advice for this person. But they knew I was a Christian. They knew I read the Bible. They knew I prayed. So they would begin to come to me because they saw that balance in my life. When the Twin Towers were hit, I had people go, pray for me, Nick, pray for me. And I responded with, I can pray until my lips turn blue for you, but you need to get your heart right with Jesus. But they knew where to turn because of that balance. When we look at the balance of relationship with God and people in Scripture, it's everywhere in the Word of God. In our text, Jesus says to Peter three times, Do you love me? And every time he says yes, he responds with, then take care of people. And so, in Scripture, when something he says twice, it's important. But for him to say it three times, that's obviously very important. And Jesus is about to send into heaven, and people are about, uh, Peter's about to go start his ministry. And he, this is, so this is key to his ministry. And the one thing he says is, take care of people. Feed my sheep. In Matthew 25, 35 through 40, it says, Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophet. So here's Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, confirming that this balance is so crucial that all the other things in the Word of God hang on these two commandments. Love God and love people. If you, if you examine Jesus' life, everything He did was either ministering to people, breaking bread with people, praying with people, laying hands on people and healing people, or He was spending time with God in, in solitary or, or just talking to God the Mount of Transfiguration. He was meeting with God and meeting with people. Luke 2.52 says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. There it is again. Uh, this is a pattern that's been established. Now John 15.5 says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If we want to do anything for God, we have to have that connection with God. I've been out with uh, people, and um, we've tried we've tried to help them at times, and it was like I had I had nothing to offer them. I was carnal. I, I wasn't spiritual, and it was this wasn't recently, but I mean a while back, uh, a long time ago. And what happened is I wasn't reading my Bible at that time, or I wasn't praying. And so it was like going to battle and instead of using a sword, using a pool noodle, you know, you got nothing to offer them. And so it's not going to be spiritual and you're not going to help them. You have to stay connected to the true vine. 
John 13, 35. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is a genuine mark of your Christianity. In 2 Corinthians 5, 18. And all these things are from God, who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So let's think about the cross for a second. Here it is. It's up and down, and it's horizontal. Your relationship with God and your relationship with people. If you ever forget, that's just a visual perspective of the two relationships that are so crucial. I think back to when I first got saved. And the guy who helped me live for God, he was driving to pick me up. He was spending time with me, taking me out to eat. He was praying, and I was like, oh, this is weird. He's praying out loud, you know. A lot of things are different in Catholicism. They are when you're a Pentecostal. So this stuff is my Bible. But I couldn't deny he had a genuine relationship with God. So I was like, I was attracted to that. Because he wasn't trying to be something he wasn't. He was trying to be a Christian. And people see that. Um, and so he worked with me very closely. And I think that that is what helped me stay living for God even today. And guess what? He's a pastor now. Go figure. So... Um, Another thing I want to talk about, secondly, is the enemies of a perfect balance. Uh, I grew up in Michigan, and it's cold in Michigan. It's going to be cold in Indianapolis, we're gearing up for that. But it's very cold in Michigan, and you have fireplaces. Everyone has a fireplace. And what you do is you go outside, and you take a wedge, and you can pound it down into pieces of wood, and it will split them down the middle. And then you stack that firewood along your house, and then your parents probably make you go get it when it's really cold, because they don't want to get it. So, that wedge is de designed to separate, to drive a wedge between one board and the other, one piece of wood and the other. And that's uh, what these hindrances can do with your relationship with God and your relationship with people. The first enemy of relationship with God and man is sin. The Bible says when Adam and Eve sinned, they hid themselves. Um, it's no, it's no a mystery that when you have sin in your life, um, you, you want to hide. And so we, we oftentimes see people coming to church, they're doing well, you know, and we're like, oh yeah, they look like they're doing good. And then all of a sudden they start to miss, or they start struggling. And people begin to wonder, oh, what happened? You know, why are they missing? Why are they not calling anymore? It's, it's no secret what it is, most of the time, is sin. Has, has begun to separate them from relationship with God and people. John 1, 5 says, And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So you think about that scripture, and you're like, oh, that means Jesus came into the earth, and the earth didn't understand what he was trying to say. Not exactly. The word comprehend is the Greek word katalambano. I think that's actually Spanish. But, uh, it means to seize a tight hold of, to arrest, to capture. And so here's Jesus. He steps on the scene, and now he's in the world, the light of the world, and the darkness sees Jesus and it says, I can't arrest Jesus. I can't capture him. I can't take dominion over him. I can't dominate him. And so, the gathering demoniac, that same Greek word, katalambano, is used in the context of it seized him. It threw him down. And I want you to know tonight, if you're in sin... That's what sin wants to do to you. It wants to seize you. It wants to take hold of you, capture you, and throw you down and dominate you. But the light, it can't be dominated. Jesus cannot be dominated. And you can meet with Jesus at an altar and out. You can repent and get free. Uh, the second enemy of your relationship with God and men is what I like to call the shallow end. Uh, Luke 5, 4, when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Now the context here is 
Jesus is calling Peter into the ministry. And he's saying, okay, now that I'm done preaching, I'll get in your boat. Why don't you go over there? But he, we toiled all night. No, I don't care. Go over there and let down your net. And he says, okay, I'll, I'll do it. And I'll be obedient. And now catches just a multitude of fish. And he says, you know, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. He knows that this is God. Uh, but what I want to talk about in this portion of Scripture is, he said, go out into the deep. You're not going to catch anything in the shallow area. And what I want you to know is, if your relationship with people or with God is shallow, you're not going to see the fruitfulness that you want. If you walk up to someone, hey, how's the weather? How's it going? Okay, I'll talk to you later. You know, then you're not, they're not going to open up to you about their deepest, darkest thoughts, you know. That's not going to happen, you know. They're not going to ask you to pray with them if, if your biggest conversation is the weather or the football game. And so, we as a people, and I'm not beating you up, Chandler Church, I know that you guys do this, but we need to continue to do this. We need to continue to take time to talk with people, to, to not be shallow in our relationships and really dig deep and see where people are at, how they're doing. Is there anything I can pray for? How's your family? Oh, yeah? How's the job going? Is there, do you have any questions? Because I know when I came into church, I had questions. Why do you raise your hands? Why do you speak in tongues? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? And so I had a ton of questions. And maybe they're, they're too shy to ask them. But if you dig a little, you'll find out that they'll open up and you'll be, be able to help them and speak a word of truth that they desperately needed in that time and that season. Um, this is something I struggled with, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm hitting on it, because I took a personality test a while back. Um, I'm not a psychologist. Uh, I don't promote all that. But it was actually in church, and it was uh, to find out what biblical character your personality aligns with. And I guess I aligned with Apollos, which kind of stinks because you really don't read much about Apollos. So I don't really know much about myself. But one of the things that said is that it, you you know we're boisterous, we're you know enthusiastic, but what can happen is we can battle with being shallow um, because if me and you are friends, and then it's not working here, I just go on my next friend. Hey. And I'll go hang out with them because I got friends. You know, I'm happy. I'm, I'm, so in that, I had to target that area of my life and say, no, 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 no. I've got to take time to call people, see how they're doing, and invest in them because I can't have shallow relationships and pretty much do anything for God. Uh, the other relationship, obviously, that you can't be shallow in is your relationship with God himself. And that's why uh, I encourage you to ask yourself tonight, how's my relationship with God? When is the last time I heard from God? When is the last time I set aside time for God? When is the last time I really read my Bible and God spoke to me in His Word? Do I pray in the mornings or have a set prayer time? Is God a genie who just grants my wishes or do we have a real relationship? So, if your relationship with God is shallow, it can get deeper. Um, you know, there's <laughs> and 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 um, one of the things that shallow relationships, what happens is, if you aren't in good relationship with people, and they're always coming to help you and serve you, and then those people, they have to go help someone else. They have to go serve someone else. So now they're no longer taking care of you like they were for the last year or two in the church. Well, what happens is if you've been in the church for any length of time and you're serving God and you're doing well, then they don't necessarily always feel obligated to check on you if you're not reaching out to them. They see that you're doing okay and they may go help someone else because there's plenty of needs in the house of God. And what happens is those people who are here, but they have shallow relationships, then they begin to get angry. And they begin to go, why aren't they calling me anymore? This church has no love. What's going on? But the reality is, they're just trying to help someone else. They don't have time to literally help everyone. So they're just trying to meet a need somewhere else. And so, uh, 
I don't promote JFK's lifestyle, but he did say, and so my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And so I would take that and I would flip it to something spiritual and say, ask not what Jesus can do for you, but what can you do for Jesus? Ask not what the door church can do for you, but what can you do for the door church? Ask not what Pastor Campbell can do for you, but what can you do for Pastor Campbell or Pastor Tozer or Pastor Hill? What can you do for the people who were helping you for that long? And, and when you do that, we as a congregation now become mature and we're not just consumers. But now we, we give something back and God says, ha ha, I can bring in more people because you'll take care of them. And so I encourage you, don't be shallow. Really get, get deep in relationship with people and begin to help if you're not helping. And most of you are, I know. But I'm, I'm just encouraging you because I want to see Chandler Church just explode with revival. And I think that's that's one thing that will help. Um, getting your balance back. Um, you know, we've all stumbled at times. But here's some keys to getting your balance back. The number one is devotional time with God. Parentheses, not church only. And the reason why I say that is because uh, this doesn't mean stop coming to church. You still need to come to church. But what happens is people rely on their spiritual food. Their only spiritual food they eat is in church. Uh, only Sundays, only Wednesdays, and maybe uh, at times of revival. And then that hinders their relationship with God to where they don't continue to grow. Um, I encourage you to come to morning prayer. Read your Bible. And, and set aside some time with God. Uh, it doesn't have to be in the mornings, but I know that Jesus prayed in the mornings. Mark 1.35 says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Jesus went to morning prayer. This is our pattern. Um, I know when I first came here, <laughs> It was like the first time I ever went to morning prayer. And uh, I was still on East Coast time, so I think I walked in at like 5 a.m. Um, I didn't walk in at 5 a.m. anymore, but I uh, went and sat in the corner over there. If anyone knows, that's Pastor Campbell's prayer spot. And I was sitting there, and the chairs were kind of covering me, and he kept me around the corner. He's like, oh, hey, Nick. And I was like, oh, hey. You know, I didn't think anything of it until the next service. I saw him praying there, and I was like, I stole his prayer song. Oh, my gosh, I'm such a sinner. I was like, oh. <laughs> I've never sat there again, full disclaimer. But uh, if I could quote Pastor Campbell, where's your prayer spot? I like the ledges because I can set my drink up there. But... <laughs> I encourage you, if you don't have one, get a prayer spot. Uh, Luke 4, 1 through 4 says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command the stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Men shall not live by bread alone, but every word of God. So, if you're going to live in this world, in the flesh, you're going to need to eat food. But if you're going to live for Jesus, you're going to need to eat the word of God. You have to have a steady diet. The question is, do we eat every week on Sundays and Wednesdays only. Because I don't think that we're eating Sundays and Wednesdays only when it comes to food. But if we did that spiritually, how would you look at the end of the year? I would be in great shape. <laughs> but some of you would, would, would not make it. And so I would encourage you, you're going to have to to take some time on your own 
and get in God's Word. Uh, verse 12 and 13 of our text, Jesus said to them, oh, I'm sorry. The, the second uh, way to get your balance back is the breaking of bread and prayers. Now, we, we even recently heard this from Pastor Campbell, who's eating at your table. And so we know that this is crucial. Uh, verse 12 and 13 of our text, Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. Now this isn't the first time Jesus was eating with his disciples. This is a common practice. That he ate with them after the road to Emmaus. He's feeding the 5,000, and then he's feeding another multitude of people. So this is what Jesus does. The breaking of bread and prayers. The Last Supper. It wouldn't be called the Last Supper if there was no supper before it. So there you go. He ate with the disciples. And it's crucial. We need to do that too. But the reason why I say breaking of bread and prayers is because, and this goes back to what I was talking about before, there's been times where I've been out with people or I didn't have anything to offer or I may have even tried to steer the conversation for Christ and they wouldn't do it because they were carnal. The reality is they're going to be breaking the bread, but it's not real genuine fellowship if God is not on your lips, if God is not coming, if they're not strengthened, then it's just meaningless. It's just eating food. And so I encourage you in, in your fellowship, really lift up the name of Jesus, really impart vision, because there's some older saints in here, and you guys are full of vision and passion, and just pass that on to these people, because they're hungry for it. They might not know they're hungry for it, but they are. Some of them do know. They want to hear it. Um, Acts 2.46, and they continued, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking the bread and prayer. So, this is after Jesus ascends, and they're continuing in this. And I encourage you guys to continue in this. Um, and the last thing I want to say that is the key to getting your balance back is taking care of Jesus. Uh, in Matthew 25, 35 through 46, it says, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will ask him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? Or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Surely I say to you, and as much as you did to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Surely I say to you, as much as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So these people that we're talking about caring for, the, the people that Jesus is saying, Feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Essentially, this is Jesus. The visitor uh, that comes in and sits down uh, after services started, or the new convert you're working with, or maybe the older convert uh, that's struggling or, and starting to miss, and just struggling, or maybe the backslider who you've been in communication with, they reached out to you, they want to get right. All these people, they're Jesus. Jesus says, care for them, and you're caring for me. So I encourage you. So that's crucial that we take care of Jesus. Uh, it's said that the key to having good balance and good posture is stretching exercises 
which strengthen your core. God wants us all to be stretched. Uh, Pastor Campbell took a step of faith in this conference to facilitate that stretching by sending out 11 couples. And we thank you for that. But that means that that's going to stretch the core. If you've ever lifted weights, you know that stretching and strain and just heaviness and burden, at first it weighs you down, but after a while, you get stronger and stronger and stronger. And so the pillars here, your guys going to continue to do what you've been faithfully doing for years long before I came here. But there are newer people, and I encourage you, go for God. Run for Jesus. You're going to take on mantles of ministry, mantles of responsibility, mantles of destiny, mantles of calling. And mantles of service, even just cleaning the toilets. That's where my ministry started, was cleaning toilets. But it's for God. It doesn't matter. It's for God. God sees that. And I, I encourage you, take on those mantles. And that will enlarge and stretch and build the strength of that core. And have, uh, cause our congregation to have that perfect balance. If I could have every head bowed and every eye closed. So I really appreciate your attention tonight. I appreciate all of you. Uh, in the sermon you just heard, I stated that one of the enemies of the relationship with God is sin. And that sin separates us from God. I ask you tonight, is there sin in your life that's causing a distance, that's causing a division, that's beginning to separate you and your relationship with God? Maybe you're visiting. This is your first service for. Maybe you've come out a few times before, but you've never really given your life to Jesus Christ. And some may have even prayed a prayer at one time, but if God were to come back right now, if you were to step into eternity, you don't know that your heart is right with God. In fact, you might even think, I know my heart's not right with God. Well, tonight, we have an altar call so that you can get your heart right with Jesus Christ. So that you can invite Him to be Lord of your life. When I got saved, I just thought it would just be some religious prayer. I didn't think there would be any change. I thought I was going to put on new clothes, try and be good. But that is not what happened. I want you to know, I prayed a prayer, and the weight of sin, the weight of wrongdoing, the weight of guilt and shame was lifted off my shoulders. I became a new man. The sky was bluer, the grass was greener. I had a, a peace and a joy and a purpose for once in my life I had a purpose and I want you to know God has a purpose for your life in this place tonight but if you're not right with God He leaves that decision to you do you want to enter into that purpose do you want to get right if you do I ask you simply raise your hand we count it a privilege to pray for you just Raise your hand and say, God, that's me. The Bible says, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. I see that hand. And I want you to know, if you draw near to God, if you raise your hand right now, God wants to draw near to you at an altar tonight. Just raise it up. No one's looking around. Just raise up your hand, and we'll pray with you. Backslider, maybe you were right with God at one time. Oh, I see that hand. But through the process of time, you've grown cold. And you say, you know what? It's time I gave. You can put it down. I see that hand. And you say, you know what? I've grown cold. I've grown religious. But I want to go for God. I'm stirred. I want to give my life back to Jesus. My whole heart. Not a little piece, but my whole heart. And that's you tonight. You say, I'm going to give my life back to Christ and really, really mean it. 
Just simply raise your hand, and we've counted a privilege to pray with you. Little kids raising their hand. I won't hold it out much longer. If you're not right with God in this place tonight, just raise it up. Okay. That one, you, you're coming, sir. You raised your hand in the back, or was that ma'am? Uh, raise your hand if you could come. And we'll have someone pray with you. Hope I hope the sermon ministered to you tonight. And uh, I just encourage you. You guys have been such a blessing to us. But if you know my relationship with God has taken a step back. Or my relationship with people is not what it was. And I encourage you to come to this altar tonight and make some fresh commitments and rededicate those things. These altars are open.
pray that God seal this, not just in your heart, but in my heart. I know if we're going to be fruitful in Indianapolis, we're going to need to love people and we're going to need to be in constant relationship with Jesus Christ. So this isn't just for you, this is definitely for us. Um, I'm going to turn the service back over to Pastor Campbell. Thank you so much for everything Shannon. Thank you. Seated, you may find your seat this right. evening. Um, the may I? We want to take just a couple moments and pray uh, for Nick and Cicely. And Cicely will make her way to the platform. And then uh, I see Pete White's here. Um, and then the staff, if you make your way to the platform, uh, uh, we want to we pray uh, for them in just a moment. Uh, but I want to give you a chance to. Uh, Testify. Cicely, I uh, married her mom and dad, and uh, we launched her parents, and I launched her children. You can't imagine, uh, as many of you were here during that time, uh, to see these children of people that have gone into the ministry, rise up and want to go into the ministry. So I want to give you a chance to testify. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Cicely. Um, I grew up. In this church, uh, my parents were pastors. Um, my mom says, you know, I was born into the church, so I knew all that God was doing, and I saw it firsthand. Uh, but, you know, Pastor Campbell talks about that revelation, and it wasn't until I was 18 that I finally got that revelation. I fell into sin, I, I did things that, you know, growing up, you hear are bad, 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 don't, you know, that's sin, and you see where it takes you. But it was just like, I was pulled in that direction, and God brought me to a point where he said, this is, this is it. Where are you going to go? Are you going to live for me, or are you going to go off and you're going to turn into one of those people that, that you see give testimonies? Which one are you going to be? And I said, you know what, God, I can't live that life. I can't do that, God. I know that you called me for something. You've raised me up for something. And I gave my life to God, and I said, use me as a vessel. And 10 years later, here I am. God's using my life, you know, I have beautiful children, and we're going to go out and preach in Indiana, you know, but I know that if it wasn't for this church, if it wasn't for Pastor Campbell, not only investing into Nick and I, but into my parents, I would not be here, and I'm so grateful and thankful for everybody. I'm so thankful for my new sisters, Paula and you, you guys are, are in my heart, I love you guys, Veronica, Sarah Monins, you know. Everybody here, you guys have been such a blessing, and I can't, I can't even imagine where my life would be without you, so thank you. Like I said, uh, there's so many uh, I would like to thank. Um, Jacob and, and Cameron, thank you guys for helping us move, and all that you did for us before that. We, we could have even been leaving to, tomorrow if it weren't for these guys over here, so... Um, but just the relationships we have. Phil Cass, um, I was up there doing follow, and I didn't know half of you people. And Phil Cass said, oh, that, that person, they were here 15 years ago, they're back now. And uh, if, I, if he wasn't up there, I would have been drowning. So thank you so much, Phil Cass. Um, and just the guys I labored with and the dramas, countless dramas. We did some crazy stuff, but I think some people got saved out of it, so thank you so much. Um, Caesar. He was my first friend when I got here. Caesar, thank you. Uh, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. I'm not going to cry because I'm a man, but <laughs> thank you. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand with us. And uh, I want to remind you as well to be refreshments at the fellowship hall. Uh, and continue to pray for them. Uh, continue to pray for them. Uh, in Indianapolis, Indiana. We'll ask them, uh, let's pray for them. Uh, Father, by the blood of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Ghost, uh, I pray for Sicily, God. I pray for Nick, God. We release them into your purposes, God. You keep them for kingdom business. Give them divine favor in this city, God. Give them divine appointments uh, and connections with people, God. Uh, God, train them uh, under your hand, God. Revelation. Uh, give them understanding of ministry. Uh, God, I'm praying, God, you 
raise up a powerful word cup in Indianapolis. God, a supernatural word cup. We release them, God. We thank you for their family. Bless, bless and anoint God. in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you, Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Well, glory. Praise God. Amen. Uh, so good to, to have each of you this evening. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Ryan Birch, uh, uh, just got here from Pittsburgh, Kansas, if he would pray this evening. 